You see, you have a choice. Every day you get to choose how to speak to yourself. But you know what you don't get to choose? What you do to your body when you say, I'm an idiot. I knew I'd mess that up. I knew that relationship wouldn't work. I've been waiting for it to go wrong. Stop using lucky language. Success, we will don't talk about wishing, hoping, or dreaming. They go, I am, I can, I will. The mind will believe everything you tell it. Tell it great things. What I'm gonna do with you today is I'm gonna take you first through the rules of the mind. They're my rules of the mind, I, I made them up, but I made them up over 33 years. And somebody said to me once, well, who are you to make this up? I went, well, someone's got to do it. I think 33 years of working with royalty and Olympic athletes gives me the right to say, these are the rules of the mind. And if ever you're stuck with a client, stuck with a child, stuck with an adult that needs some help, and you think, oh, I don't know what to do take them through the rules of the mind because it actually blows their mind. They go, well, I never knew that. I didn't understand that. And we will come after the rules of the mind to language patterns. Now I've given you some slides on language patterns that are really for young children, but they also are very effective for adults. So let's do a quick little language thing right now. I want you to close your eyes and I want you to go, I'm going to try to remember these rules of the mind. I'm going to try so hard to memorize it. If only I could memorize that document. I wish I had a better memory. I hope I can remember that when I'm working with my own client. I really hope I can do what she does. I wish I could do it. I hope to do it. I'm going to try to do it. I really want to do it. And just focus on how you feel when you use the word wish, which is wishy-washy. I don't like wish. Wishing says to your mind, you haven't got a prayer, but you might as well wish. Because wishing just says, you're not going to do that. Oh, I wish. No one says, I wish I could get up in the morning and clean my teeth. I wish I could pick up that pencil and write a note. You don't say wish. You go, I'm doing it. So when you say to the mind, I wish I could, it says, yeah, me too. Get over it. When you say to the mind, I hope, I hope I get this right, it goes, yeah, well, keep hoping, because you're not going to do that. When you go, if only, your mind goes, well, you never managed it before, so keep on with the if only, why don't you? But when you do it differently, close your eyes again and go, I will memorize this. It's going in. I have a phenomenal memory. My memory is awesome. I read things and they empower me and they stick. I am remembering it all. I do this. I've got it. I have a phenomenal memory. I have incredible powers of recall and assimilation. And I remember everything. It has a totally different effect. And so you learn with language. I never let my clients say wish. I won't allow them to say the word but. I could do that, but no, we never say but. We also never say should. My therapist said to me, excuse me, swearing, should is shit, and never use that word. I should, I say I could. I should go to the gym. I could go to the gym, but I know it's my fault. I'm not making the effort. So with young children, just changing one word will change their life. I'll give you an example. My little girl would go to school, and she'd get to the gate and she'd come back. And I'd always say, what have you remembered? Could have said, what have you forgotten? There's only two words. What have you, and she goes, I've remembered my swimming kit. I've remembered my book. I've remembered my peak. I go, that's fantastic. You have such a great memory that when you get to the gate, you remember and back you come. And very quickly, she didn't have to come back because I never said, what have you forgotten today? Oh my God, your mind is like a sieve. What's wrong with you? You get to the gate and I never do that. And you forget, why can't you be like me? I have my little bag by the door. I put everything the night before. And I never did that. I said, what have you remembered? So here's just one word. And my clients really taught me the power of words because I'd see the ones who'd come and go, I wish I could do that. Oh, thanks, Marissa, for all this. I could do that, but I know I ought to do that and I should, but. And so I started banning words. I said, when you come in this office, you're not allowed to go wish, but hope. 
I work a lot with infertile women and the ones who don't get pregnant always say that I wish I could get pregnant. And then when they get pregnant, they say, I'm so scared of losing it. I'm not going to tell anyone just in case I lose it. I'm like, well, but what are you saying to your baby? It's in the womb, the most developed sense is hearing. I'm not even gonna tell anyone you're here because I have no faith you're going to make it. I go, how about sending the scans out to your parents and showing them, this is my baby, it's staying, my body made it, my body is so super smart. My body is gonna carry this baby to full term. This is my one chance in the world to be God. I'm making a miracle here. And my body is growing that baby physically, and I'm growing and nurturing that baby emotionally and every day I tell it, today your spine is forming. This week your mouth and lips are forming and your ears are forming and it sends a message to the brain that goes, this is working, whereas running to the bathroom every hour to just see if you're spotting, saying, oh, I'm really scared of losing it, sends a message to the mind and one of the rules of the mind, and it's the best rule, is that Every thought you think and every word you say forms a blueprint and your mind must work to make that blueprint real. So when you say, I can't remember anything, I'd lose the eyes in the back of my head if they weren't fixed in there because I just can't remember anything. Your mind goes, that's a blueprint. Let me take you to it. And when you say, my memory is phenomenal, foolproof. In fact, I'm like human Google. When I read an exam, the minute I read the question, my mind has already gone to work, found the answer, and I, it stays in my head right through until I write it on the paper. Then I read the next question, the same thing happens as I read the question. Google says, here's the answer. I work with children all the time with exam stress, and they come in. I was a little boy last year who had, um, I think there were 17 children applied for every place in his school and he flunked the mocks. And I'm like, darling, you're supposed to flunk the mocks. It's great to flunk the mocks. You know what mocks are, don't you? Oh, so in England, when you're taking an exam, you have a mock exam, maybe six weeks before you take the exam just to see how you do. And then they say, well, you did terribly, you did really well. And because you did really well, you're going to pass that exam. And because you did terribly, you're going to fail. In fact, the ones who do well in the mocks get so complacent, they often don't do so well in the act actual exam. And the ones who do badly think, wow, I need to up my game. I need to revise more and study more. So when he came in and said, my mummy was so upset because I got really bad marks in the marks. I went, that's fantastic. What were you worth on? He said, the, 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 the writing, what did you do? So I didn't read the instructions correctly and I didn't use the right words. But that's fantastic. So what did you need to do? And just by changing his language, I didn't use the right words and explained to him that he could do it and telling him that his mind was like Google. Then I was asking him some questions about Harry Potter. And I said, how do you know these answers? Have you studied Harry Potter? He went, no, I just really like it. I said, well, see how clever your mind is. So when you're working with a kid that says, I don't know, ask them about James Bond. Ask them about something that they like and go, how do you know this? They go, I don't know. How do you know? Wow, you're so smart. Because when they like something, they remember. And part of school is liking something. So with this little kid, he got into that school. I knew he'd get in because he came in like that and he left like that. He was like, I'm going to nail this. I know what to do. My mind is like Google. And I will say to all my clients, whether they're a seven-year-old taking an exam or someone taking a medical exam or the bar, I say, whatever you're reading, your focus narrows down. You say the word narrow down. And when you say narrow down, everything fades away. You're absorbed in that paper. You have phenomenal powers of concentration, comprehension, recall, retention, and assimilation. And I, I say words that help you do the next one. Comprehension, comprehension, retention, recall, assimilation. I say it over and over again because the mind believes what you tell it. So let's go through the rules of the mind. Here is the first one. What is expected tends to be realized. When you say to a child, 
I don't know what's wrong with you. Your brother was in my class last year and he was so good. Why can't you learn? Why can't you sit still? Why are you so disruptive? What is wrong with you? You're making words that form a child's blueprint. And exactly the same for adults. I'm referring this a lot to children, but for the therapists here, those children come in as your clients. But it's just the same for adult. If, if your boss says to you, uh, uh, can you do this? And you go, oh my God, I, I'm going to have to race through it and I'm going to have to rush it. I haven't got enough time to prepare. I know I'm going to get it wrong. I'm going to go on stage, open my mouth and go, oh, oh, oh. Well, when you say that, it tends to be realized. And here's one of my favorite rules of the mind. The mind responds to words that make a picture. So in America, they were giving these kids pencils called don't do drugs. And as they sharpened them, the word don't disappeared. And they said, do drugs. Not very smart. You need to put that the other way around. What is expected tends to be realized. When a child is doing something like climbing a tree and the mother goes, you're going to fall. You're going to break your leg. Oh my God, you're going to break your ankle. You can make that happen. And when you say to the child now, I know you're climbing the tree. Look where you're putting your hands. Look where you're going to place your feet. Focus on what you're doing. That will be realized. So in powerful language, you can never say you're going to fall. You're going to mess that up. You're going to ruin everything. That's just not going to work out. You have to say the opposite. Okay. I've only got 10 minutes to prepare my speech. I only need 10 minutes. I've only got 10 minutes to get there. That's exactly how much time I need. And if I'm late, I wasn't supposed to be there on time. I have a belief now when I get to a party late, it's because it wasn't, I wasn't meant to get there early. I no longer go, oh my God, I'm so late. This is going to be terrible. In fact, I was recently going in a cab across town to get a train to work with a football team. And we got stuck in traffic. And so I was playing a game. I thought, oh my God, I'm going to miss the train. This is terrible. I'm going to ruin my reputation. The team are going to be so upset. And I felt really sick. And then I started to say, the trains run every 20 minutes. It doesn't matter what's 20 minutes. My material is so great. They have lots of time. After all, they finish um, practicing at 3 o'clock. And, and it was fine. So all the way there, I was playing a game and I actually got the train on time, but they really wouldn't have minded. But I could have ruined my day, made myself panicky and sweaty by going, oh my God, I haven't got enough time and now it's all ruined. And it's never ruined. You can come back from anything. And then I worked with a client who had cancer and had to go into this MRI scanner. And every time I saw him, he's like, I can't, I can't do it. I can't get in that scanner. And I wonder, he said, well, I feel like I'm in my coffin. I feel like it's a premonition of my death. And when I get in the scanner, I think, well, I've got cancer and I'm going to die. And what, he said, well, I freak out. I press the button. I have to come out. And they keep saying, look, you've got to. I can't. I can't even be in there for two seconds, which is not true. And say, I, can, I can't do it for even a second. He probably was in there for a few minutes. I said, look, the words you say to yourself in that scanner, this is a premonition of my death. I feel like I'm in a coffin. I feel like I'm suffocating and I can't do it. That's a blueprint. And your mind doesn't like those words. So how about these words? How about saying, I'm in my bed at home and I'm just so chilled and I could lie here for hours. I'm chilled, I'm relaxed, I'm blissed out. You must use words that make a picture. You can't go, oh, I'm okay, really. I'm quite good. I'm not bad. This is okay. Because... When I say the words, okay, not bad, what's the picture? There's no picture, it's what I call fluff. When you say I'm chilled, I'm blissed out, I'm ecstatic, I'm just lying here and I could do this for hours, it's just so cool, the mind goes, you're right. And when you go, I'm in a coffin and I'm suffocating, the mind goes, you're right. See, here's the great thing. You can choose any words you like. You can go, well, we're all going to be negative, and this half's going to be positive. That's your choice. You know what you can't choose? 
what you do to yourself when you say, I'm an idiot, I'm a moron, I'm a retard, I've got rocks for brains, everything goes wrong. Who would ever like me? I've got cellular, I'm a single parent, I've got no chance, blah, blah, blah. I didn't go to college, so I couldn't possibly do what you do. I got kicked out of college, by the way, so you can definitely do what I do. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me. I can look at my life and say being fired, being dumped, and being kicked out of college. Thank you, God, for putting that in, up to me because it changed my life. It was the best thing. Rejection has been one of the best things that ever happened to me. Being the least favorite kid, if I could have my life again, I'd go back and be the least favorite kid because I thought I'm going to show my parents that I'm something. And if I was the favorite, I wouldn't have done that. I would have had a totally different life. So with my client, I was saying, you know, these words are really important. So he got in the scanner, he stayed there for hours. And he said that when he came out, all the nurses and doctors came in and gave him a standing ovation. He said it was more powerful than his last business deal because he felt so good. Some years later, I had to go in a scanner. I thought, well, I'm just going to play with this. I love playing with words. So I lay there. And I was going, I'm so chilled. This is so good. How many of us have said, I'd love 20 minutes to myself? Well, here I am, 20 minutes to myself. I can lie here and do nothing. No one's going, can you proof this copy? Can you answer this email? Can you speak to this client? My daughter's going, mommy, my boiler's broken in my apartment. Can you come over right now and fix it? I had 20 minutes to myself. And I was going, I'm so chilled. And then I thought, let's do the opposite. So I was like, I, I, I'm in a coffin. I got claustrophobia. I feel like I'm trapped. And all the buzzers went off, and I didn't even know I was moving. And then they speak to her, and I said, Marissa, you have to lie completely still. Stop moving. So I had to go back into, I'm chilled, I'm ecstatic, I'm blissed out. And I love doing that. And it's a really good thing to do to yourself. I'm late, I've ruined everything. I have all the time I need. You see, you have a choice. Every day you get to choose how to speak to yourself. But you know what you don't get to choose? What you do to your body when you say, I'm an idiot. I knew I'd mess that up. I knew that relationship wouldn't work. I've been waiting for it to go wrong. In fact, the day we got married, I stuck stickers on all my stuff so that when we got divorced, there'd be no confusion. <laughs> I was already planning the miscarriage. I didn't buy anything for my baby. I mean, who does that? Lots of people, apparently. They're all my clients, and they plan for stuff to go wrong. They say, I sent my kid to college, and I said, don't worry, you're probably going to hate it. Here's a credit card so you can get a return ticket back in a week's time. They plan it, and you don't want to plan it. You want to ban it. So words are really powerful. You can choose to be negative or positive. That's your choice, but you cannot choose what you do to yourself when you use negative language. So the first rule of the mind, what you expect is realized. Who thinks that's true? So here's my advice to you, expect amazing things then. If what is expected tends to be realized, expect the best. Expect love and success and an amazing life because you know what? It will probably be realized really fast if you expect it. Imagination is more powerful than knowledge when dealing with your own mind and the mind of others. If I said to any of you, come and stand on this chair, who would come and stand on this chair? I'll give you $100 to stand on this chair. Sure, if I said, well, now the chair is, that, is on top of that spire on the highest building in Tallinn, who's going to climb up and stand on it for $100? Who would do that? Some people would, because they've got a good imagination. They go, if I can stand on it there, I can stand. And most people go, no, I could fall. If you've got a little tiny plank up here, you can walk the plank when it's on the floor. Put the plank between two high-rise buildings. Who's going to walk it? Not many people, because the imagination that you could fall and kill yourself is way more powerful than the knowledge that I did this on the ground. It's wide enough. Fear of flying. Knowledge says it's actually the safest place in the world. The most dangerous part of a flight is actually the drive to the airport. That's way more dangerous than being in the plane. Do you think the imagination cares? We'll go, I'm in a flying coffin. I'm hurtling through the air. And that guy looks like he's come straight out of ISIS. And he's in the bar. I think he's going to blow up the plane. 
And then you feel terrible. The other person's going, I'm watching a movie. I've always wanted to watch The Shape of Water. This is so great. Here's my time again to do nothing. So whatever you imagine will defeat logic, will defeat knowledge. And when dealing with children, people do logical. Talk. Why are you so bad? Why can't you get it? What's going on? Why are you so naughty? And that doesn't work. I never say to kids, why are you bad? I go, what happened to you? I was working with a little kid recently who always played up before lunch and would get hysterical after every meal. And I'd actually been in an orphanage in Zimbabwe and I'd seen that a lot, that at the end of the meals, the kids start weeping uncontrollably because they don't know when the next meal is coming. And they go, look, you're in an orphanage, it's fine. We have food, you'll be fed three times a day. It takes about two years for those children to stop crying as they remove the plates because the emotion is, when's the next meal coming? So this little boy was really difficult at school and he'd been to three different schools. And one of the teachers contacted me and I said, when does he do it? He said, well, he always does it before meals. And I said, you should ask him not why he does it, but what happened to him. And then the mother came in and said, well, well I adopted him at one. He was born to crackheads. And he cr used to cry when I left the room. And when I read his notes, his parents would leave the room for three days. And he didn't get fed very much. And so he's got this panic about not being fed. And I said, but well, you should tell the school that. And of course, you can't logically say to a child, look, you're going to be fed every four hours. You have to go, look, you have some memories. They're really sad, but mommy is going to put some nuts in your bag. And you're always going to have something. And you can't do it logically because feeling is more powerful than logic. The feeling you're going to die on a plane will always wipe out the logic. That this is the safest way to travel. One of my clients said, please help me. So I've done the logic. I went to British Airways flying course. I walked into the cockpit wearing shorts and I lost control of my bowels in front of everyone. Now I'm even more scared about flying because this was a course to make you better. They were logically showing me all the controls. When they said they were taking off, I had a terrible accident. I knew it was bad because the pilot put a mask on and I had to be taken off that plane. And now I'm even further back from ever flying because logic doesn't work. Emotion does. And so I would talk to her and say, you know, you have to pretend you're at the front. You have to say when you're on the plane, I love it. Oh my God, flying thrills me. It elates me. It empowers me. It delights me. I love flying. Your mind goes, you're right. And when you go, I'm going to be blown out of the sky, it's a smithereens, your mind goes, you're right. Because here's another rule of the mind. It does not care if what you do is right or wrong good or bad, true or false, healthy or unhealthy, just lets it in. So let me show you. Put your hand in front of your mouth. You may have done this before, but let's do it again. Put your hand in front of your mouth like you're about to eat. Close your eyes. And imagine you have a big, fat, juicy, gorgeous lemon in your hand. I want you to breathe in that gorgeous, gorgeous lemon smell. I want you to squish that lemon and feel the waxy surface. Open your mouth, still with your eyes closed. Shove that lemon in your mouth and eat it. I want you to bite the flesh of that lemon. Suck out the flesh. Suck out the lemon. Start chewing it, eating it. Eat that whole entire half of a lemon. Keep going, keep sucking, chewing and swallowing. And open your eyes. And put your hand up if you made saliva. So here's a question for you. Where was the lemon? Where was it? Say that again. Yeah, people say there wasn't one. Oh, there was. There definitely was a lemon. It was in your imagination. You know there's no lemon. You go, what's going on here? I know there's no lemon. Why am I pumping out saliva and going like that? What am I doing that for? I know it's not there. But your mind believes it. The mind will believe everything you tell it, tell it great things. 33 years of being a therapist, I might work with a movie star, an Olympic athlete, or someone who's a school teacher, and they all have the same problem. And the problem is almost always I'm not enough. I mean, I've worked with so many addicts, thousands of addicts. I've never met one who ever thought they're enough. And they'll say, you know, I drink because I'm not enough. I use because I'm not enough. I am addicted to spending because I'm not enough. And 
What I see many therapists doing is the client comes in with a list, like what I call a shopping list. I, I, I need to stop drinking, I need to get out of bed, I need to stop shouting at my kids, I need to take care of myself. And they like to go through the list. It takes a long time. I go, oh, forget the list. Let's look at what, what I call what lies beneath. You know your problem? You think you're enough. Where does that, is ever, do you know a baby who's ever been born and goes, I, I shouldn't cry because I don't deserve attention here. I shouldn't throw up on this white top my mum just bleached. No baby is ever born believing they're not enough. And so, again, we look at where does this come from, this belief you're not enough? Who told you that? Where did you get that? And when they go, oh, yes, it came from here. It's a game changer because they start to tell them, I'm, I'm enough. People say, but if I'm enough, don't I just lie on the couch and eat potato chips all day? No. When you know you're enough, then you go, right, I, I need a better relationship. There's a better career than this, a be better health than this. So, Why do you think that is, that is a true um, movement for that? Because one thing that I struggle with, with the notion of somebody just telling themselves that they're enough, yeah. I get the underlying power of repetition, yes. the, the importance of the words, and it feels like a very good foundation it that is. the person yeah. then can build from. But where I struggle is I know that a lot of times people don't believe it. Yeah. And so if they don't ever then take those next steps of learning mm. something or pushing themselves sure. or doing something difficult, it, the words will ring hollow. Yeah. How do you help people establish meaning behind? Well, I wrote a book called I'm Enough, and we have a program called I'm Enough. And what that does is it takes you the process of where does this come from? You're not born with this belief. How did you get it? And when they discover how they got it, they're able to give it up. One of my first ever clients was this beautiful woman, very hard to believe, and she's like, I can never make a relationship last. And it sounds so silly, but she said that her dad used to say to her every day, you'll never ever find anyone that loves you like me. Nobody could love you like me. You'll never find the kind of love that I have. And he programmed. When you label someone, you limit them. So now she's got an imprint. I'm never going to find love like this love. And guess what she never found? Love like that. And all you have to do as a parent is to say, I love you because you're lovable. And all your life you'll find love like this love, because you're worth it. So it's little tiny adjustments that have the most profound effect on people. And it's never too late to say, I'm enough, I can find love. And now if you give someone the power to make you feel good, you give them the power to make you feel bad. And if you do it to yourself, you feel so much better. It makes you slightly bulletproof. You still need other people, we all need other people. But the dialoguing with yourself and starting with I'm enough, I picked that because I found all my clients, addicts, bingers, bulimics, saboteurs, hoarders, compulsive, comp compulsive shoplifters, they all went back to the same thing. I'm not enough, I need more. And if you feel enough, you start to feel equal. See, most of us feel unequal. You're better than me because you've got money or you're more attractive than me. But no dog or cat says, oh, you're better than me because you're a pedigree. A baby doesn't know that another baby's wearing designer clothes and they're not. They, they have no concept of that. So really what I'm enough is doing is reactivating, remanifesting and regenerating what you were born with, an ability to say, I'm enough. That's interesting. So part of, I think, what happens is Obviously, when a baby is born, they're lacking the sort of critical faculties yeah, to navigate the world. Yeah. So, and this is, I put my finger on this because I want people to understand that I, they're going to struggle. So it's, it's a little bit like meditation. People think yeah. I'm doing it wrong because they think there's some magical right that other people are doing and, mm. and they're not doing it. Like when you start repeating this stuff in your head, I think people will say to themselves, what do you mean you're not worthy? You bought yourself mm. a Target. Like yeah. you're not... Yeah, significant, we have a critical whatever. voice. Right. So learning that, A, that's a thing and that yeah. that's going to happen. That's a part of a normal human brain. It's mm. designed to keep you safe and alive. It's not yeah. designed to propel you forward. So, but there are, once you understand, I mean, this is your language. Once you understand how the brain works, yeah. then you can go in and begin to tinker with some of this stuff yeah. to get where you want to go. Yeah. Now, the tinkering part is what I want to get your take on. I'll use myself as an example. So, um, 
I have experienced things that have given me the story that I have a bad mm -hmm. memory. Okay. I okay. recognize it as a story, mm -hmm. but it's so fucking compelling yeah. because the evidence from the time that I was a little kid just seems irrefutable. So, okay. But I, I understand the mind well enough to know, sure. hey, I'm screwing myself over of here. Course. I'm repeating it, which is making it worse. Self-fulfilling prophecy. Okay. Jim Quick tells me, Tom, you have to stop saying that. I see you today. You're like, look, you have to stop saying that. Yeah. And so I totally buy that I have to stop saying it, but I've known that for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I'm an ultra diligent, disciplined right. person. But for some reason, I haven't worked up the desire to see that one through. Now, because I have enough self-awareness, I can guess at the reason. Mm -hmm. The biggest reason that I'm hesitant is like, okay, look, my, my energy units are finite. So getting a good memory is going to be difficult. And do I want to put the time and the energy Why into this? Yes or no? Difficult? because it's an allocation of time resources. Okay. So when I think about how far I've gotten, despite the fact that I have a bad memory, it's like, okay, it's not that big of a deal mm -hmm. to immediately address. So what all I want um, to convey with this is that sitting in neutral, it mm -hmm. won't just happen. No, you have so, to want it. Correct. So yeah. that's my very Some question. Some people don't want to go, no, I, I like being ill. It meets all my needs. I, but how I like do you get people difficult. to build that desire? Because I get asked that question a lot. Okay. So, well, most people that come to me don't go, hey, I've come to see, but I, I don't want to give up my problem. I mean, they do with food. They go, I, I want to be super healthy. Okay, you're going to stop eating donuts. I don't want to do that. Have you got anything else? I'm like, There's no. a difference between I no. don't want to do one thing yeah. and I want to do it, but I just, mm. I, I'm not sure I have the energy to see but it through. But you see, the belief is what you're saying is it's work. So much work. It's no work. So what I would suggest for someone like you is just monitor how you speak. Oh, I forgot that. I've got a terrible memory. I got that. I didn't miss that. I've got a terrible memory. And start to say, I have a phenomenal memory. I have an outstanding memory. I have a reliable, foolproof memory. So I saw it with my daughter when she was little, she'd leave the house and come back because she had so much to remember, her school bag and her swimming stuff and her lunch. And I'd always say, what have you remembered? She goes, I remembered my lunch. I remembered my swimming. I go, that's so great that you remember. And very quickly she went from, oh, forgotten, I've got to go home. My mum's going to be really cross to, no, my memory's great. At the gate it told me, school lunch, school coat. And of course, if you go to any kid's classroom, you'll see coats and bags, they, they forget everything. And we never go, well, it's the memory you see. It disappears with age. And I have a people of 90 who can tell you everything about their childhood and what it was like in the war. So you have to just make a decision to tell yourself, I have an outstanding, reliable, phenomenal, incredible, impressive, Big words, of course, because you want to excite you. And if you say it enough, your mind's job is to give you that memory and then stop saying, what have I forgotten? Say, what have I remembered? And then something else you do is just say, that will come to me. You know, you have to understand the mind a bit. So when you're dealing with a conscious mind, the subconscious doesn't do anything. If you're saying, what's the name of that book or that restaurant? Oh, I don't know. I give up. I've got terrible memory. You suddenly it goes, oh, it's come into my head. It was this book. It was the Tim Ferriss book. I remember now. Because you've given your mind an instruction. What is the name of that book? Your mind will go and find it. But if you are still actively looking, it doesn't do it. So we have something called command therapy. You've got to command your mind. Go ahead and remind me where my passport is. Remind me. And, and so often it's just really poor communication. You know, I people say, oh God, I'm flying to London tonight and I can never fall asleep on a plane. I just can't go to sleep. We're like, well, where are you going? You don't go anywhere. You don't fall. You lie on the plane and you invite sleep to come. Do you go, I'm lying here. My eyes are heavy and sleep's descending upon me like a mist. Because it's a misdirect of the mind because you don't fall and you don't go. But when you say sleep's coming to me and when I I'm in different time zones all over the world. I lie in bed and go, right, sleep now. Send sleep to me now. I, I insist on eight hours of sleep. I need eight hours. And I tell my mind what I want, but I am very clear, very specific. But not, uh, can I fall asleep? I need to, look at it. I've got to get up in five hours. And now I'm stressed. I just give my mind very clear instructions. You do have to train yourself a bit, but if you use those words, my memory is 
impressive and infallible, your mind knows what that looks like and it will make it real. If you just go, I need a better memory, that's not exciting. So excite it with powerful words and you won't be surprised or you might how much better it gets, but you've got to give up this belief that it's work. Because talking to yourself isn't work. Exciting your mind isn't work. Going to the gym is work. But saying every day as you get up, I've got a great memory. I can even imagine my diary and I can see what's in it. If you tell yourself that, it actually really becomes true. And you'll notice that everyone who's got a good memory will say, my memory is amazing. Oh, I have the best memory ever. They never go, I've got a mind like a sieve. I'd forget my head if it wasn't screwed on. I would forget the eyes in my head if they weren't there. But people with a poor memory, they, they justify it. They remind themselves how bad it is instead of deciding, no, I'm going to have a great memory. I know that people say to you a lot of times, yeah, sure, okay, this is easy for you because nothing bad has ever happened to you. But you actually had a, and I don't, I'm so curious to know how you characterize it. You had cancer. Twice, yeah. Um, I was going to say battle, and then I thought, I don't know that she would yeah, say that. Yeah, I didn't that. use the word battle. That's interesting. Mm, yeah. So, one, I'd love to hear how you yeah. do conceptualize it, of it mm. and then how you dealt with it. I think it would be really powerful for yeah, people. Yeah, would you look at me and say, well, you've had an amazing life, but you know, my life wasn't awful. My father was a headmaster. He was very invested in other people's kids. I just felt like this kind of hideous blob that wasn't interesting to him at all. I was thought I could never, ever have children. And if I got pregnant, I would never carry a baby to full term. I remember hearing that thinking, you know what, I, I have to not let this in. And that's very important to make a decision. I will not let that in. So when I was told I couldn't have a baby, I thought I'm not letting that in. And when I got pregnant, I was told many times, you're going to lose the baby. She's going to be born with something wrong with her. And I, I talked to her all the time and told her to grow perfectly. And she did. And when I was told I had cancer, I mean, of course, it's a horrible thing to hear. And I did spend the first two days thinking, oh, my God, you know, well, where am I going to go with this? But because I've taught my mind for so long to only go towards positive. I found myself on day three singing this song, and it was that song about, you know, that song, I feel pretty and witty and wise, but it was singing, I'm healing, and my body is healing, and it's healing all the time. And I just made a decision to tell my body, look, you, you, you're you going to do wellness now. And so I started to do wellness, and I visualized healing, and I visualized it being very contained, and I visualized myself bouncing back. And three weeks later, I was on stage in Costa Rica. Not because I'm super, because I told my body, uh, listen, I'm, I, I haven't got time to sit in this hospital bed with medication, do wellness. I, I really did command my body to recover. And it sounds like it's all right for you, but again, you have to understand the rules of the mind. Your body does what it says. If you go, I'm ill, I've got cancer now, it's bound to come back. And always looking for signs. People say to me, you know, I'm a cancer survivor. I'm like, oh, no, I'm not. I'm not. Because I don't have it. So I was uh, obviously surprised when I got it again. But I just had to do the same thing and say, that's it now. Twice is enough for anyone. I'm, I'm done with that. And I, I don't refer to it a huge amount. Never called it my cancer. That's my cancer. It was I've got my cancer back or I'm going for my cancer treatment. And when you Prefix something with my, you own it. Like you could look at my shoes, aren't they cool? Or got my great T-shirt. But when you say my migraine, my headache, my illness, my terrible memory, if you put the word my in front of something, it's yours. And if you call it the, it's not yours. So I was very committed to never saying my. It wasn't mine. I didn't want it. I felt very lucky that I got in an organ that I didn't need that was completely dispensable. So that was good. I remember even thinking, well, what stroke of luck that is? I don't need a womb. It's done its great job. And I talked to my mum and said, thanks for giving me this great kid. You did a great job. And now I've got to be here for this great kid. So you can leave and I'm staying. Even in surgery, your subconscious is hearing what's going on around you. And there are many people who come out of a coma who said, you know, I heard everything. The hearing is the last thing to go. And so if you make a choice to talk to yourself better, you can bounce back. You might as well use your mind as much as you possibly can to be well. So when you see people as lucky, 
that's a fixed mindset. You believe that something external has happened, just luck's descended upon them and that they're lucky. They were bestowed with all this lucky stuff, but it's not going to happen to me. And it's very important to understand that you make your own luck. A lot of what you think is luck comes down to really hard work. A lot of what looks so easy isn't easy. One of my friends who's head of a major television network said people who are talented make it look so easy. But it's really not like that at all. There's a lot of work going on. We all know the story. People, someone said to Michael Jordan, you are lucky. He said, I know the more I train, the luckier I become. So people who are lucky, actually what it is, is they have what I call the bounce back factor, They're like a big rubber ball. They bounce back, they come back, they get rejected. They hear no's, they get turned down, things go wrong, but they make a decision. Shall I let this destroy me, end me, or shall I bounce back and come back? So if you want to be lucky, you want to be perceived as lucky, you must have the bounce back factor. You see, I could say I'm very lucky. I have a wonderful life, a wonderful husband, a divine daughter, an amazing career. But I also have made my luck too. I had to work hard, but I did what I loved, so it never felt like hard work. So let's think of some of the people that you think are lucky. We might look at Tom Brady and go, well, he's lucky. Look at Tom Brady. But Tom Brady has a very particular diet. There's a lot of food he doesn't eat. There's a lot of stuff. He doesn't stay up all night drinking and partying because his mission is to be this lucky athlete. Richard Gere was called an overnight sensation when he was in an office and a gentleman, but it took him a while. He had a lot of rejections too. Many actors, many movie stars, many people who are wealthy have struggled. Richard Branson called his company Virgin because he was so naive when he first started the company. He was giving people refunds all the time. A lot of people who've created something amazing go, well, you know, it went wrong. I had lots of prototypes. It took me a long time, but here I am. So how can you be lucky? Well, first of all, understand that you make your luck. If you have persistence, if you have drive, if you have determination, you will be lucky. If you have the bounce back fact, you'll be lucky. If you have extraordinary self-belief, you'll be lucky. And these are habits you may not be born with. Although babies actually are born with drive, they are born with phenomenal self-belief and they are determined, what's your baby trying to walk? They don't go, oh, I just, you know, this walking, keep falling over, what's the point? They keep going, they try to get a banana in their mouth, it goes in their ear, in their hair, but eventually they get it because we are born with drive and determination and a belief that we are worth it. Sadly, that gets chipped away, but if you were born with it, you can get it back. Start to adopt those five attributes of luck and then stop using lucky language. Oh, I wish I could find the love of my life. I hope my career gets better. I dream of making money. I long for being in the arms of someone that loves me. You see, wishy words, what I call wishy-washy, don't say, I long, I hope, I dream, I wish, because your mind goes, yeah, keep wishing. You're never going to make that happen. Success, we all don't talk about wishing, hoping, or dreaming. They go, I am, I can, I will. When someone said to Naomi Campbell, Naomi, you'll not get onto the cover of Vogue. That door is shut to black girls. She said, and I love this about her, shut. The door's shut, I'll kick it open. I love it. That's determination. That's persistence. That's saying no. I don't do no. I will not take no for an answer. People who are lucky don't do no. They get rejected, they get fired, they get dumped. But they have the big bounce back, comeback factor. And you can decide to have that too. It's a decision. So if you have wishes and goals and dreams, write them down. Write out what they are. Write out why you want them. Write out what you are willing to do to achieve that goal. You must be prepared to do a lot. Get up early, go to bed late, give it everything you've got. So if you write it out and then take action, 
and believe you are worth it, those three things will make you lucky. And you have to have all three. You have to have the belief. This is so important. I believe I'm worth it. I'm worthy of success. I'm worthy of love. I'm worthy of wealth. You must believe you're worth it. And that's a belief that you can acquire and install. And then you must be prepared to work hard. That's so important. The best goal, the best dream won't work. If you don't, you must be prepared to give it everything you've got and a little bit more too. And then you must visualize it. See it as if it's already happened. Don't say next year I'll be wealthy. Next year I'll find love. Next year I'm going to have a beach ready body. You have to say now. I'm wealthy now. I'm successful. I'm fit now. You go, no, I'm not. It doesn't matter. The mind works in the present tense. It likes really exciting language. Go, I'm lucky. Say, I'm lucky. I'm lucky in love. Find a song about being lucky, lucky, lucky and sing it. Make it your anthem. But at the same time, believe you're worth it. Visualize it all working and put in the hours because that is what lucky people do. And that will make you lucky. Imagine someone said, hey, I've got a lucky club. You want to be a member? Sure. Well, here are the Jews. To join the lucky club, we require three things of you. They're not money. You must believe you're worth it. You must visualize. You must put in the hours. If you do that, join our club. That's how you join the lucky club. Join it. It's an amazing place to be. When you prefix any illness with my I've got my migraine, I've got my indigestion, I've got my irritable stomach, I've got my tension headache. When you call something mine, that's an ownership word and the mind does not want to give up anything you prefix with my. My fat legs, if only I didn't have these fat legs, my, my big butt, my greed, my hunger, I need my McDonald's, I gotta have my latte with my muffin. You know, when we call something mine, it's like, well, this is my child, and here's my lovely husband, and this is my gift to you. We're very proud of it. We own it. When you call it the, people say, here's the wife. Nobody likes that. Here's the husband. We don't like that. The means you don't own it. So just a little heads up. If you have anything you want to fix, physical, mental, emotional, my temper, never prefix something you want to be free with my Call it the, and the mind understands, oh, you're not invested in this. Therefore, it can go away. So I'd love to talk to you for hours, but we've got some very, very important healing to do. So what we're going to do is something called the healing vortex. And the vortex, I want you to imagine it rather like a big spinning top, rather like a tornado of energy. You're going to see it just above your head. And it's wider at its widest part than your shoulders. And it's going to come down this. Some people think it comes at them this way, but it's rather like those slinky. You know the slinky? It's going to move through you this way. And if you can imagine the rotating brushes of a car wash, their job is to dislodge, dislodge crud, to find old impacted stuff and to get it out. So the vortex is going to go through you, dislodging stuff, toxic stuff, but also toxic thoughts. And because a lot of us, it's our thoughts that make us ill. So you can do this physically, mentally, emotionally. When I do this in my own training, my staff run around and everyone in the audience has a piece of paper and they write down what they want to be healed from and we stick it on a big board. But that's with 70 people. It would just take too long today. So while I'm doing this, if you have something like I have female hormone imbalance or erectile dysfunction, which of course isn't for everyone. We're not really going to talk about that because it doesn't affect the whole audience. But that doesn't mean you can't stop and think, yeah, I'm going to work on premature ejaculation or hemorrhaging or, or painful periods. You can do whatever you like. So I'll, I'll stop this from time to time and allow you to think your own thoughts, put in your own beliefs. But it's immensely powerful. Even if we don't touch your particular issue, it will work. I'm going to start at the head. Go right down to the feet. So are you all ready? Oh, and we're going to do this in hypnosis because hypnosis is such a powerful way of getting the mind to really speak to the body. And the body listens. When you go into the subconscious mind, the conscious just goes away. And it allows the subconscious to take over. I think of the subconscious as like a Ferrari, and the conscious is like the driver of a Ferrari. 
that really hasn't had enough Ferrari driving lessons to have a clue what to do with it. Your mind is like a Ferrari. And if you have Ferrari driving lessons, you can get that Ferrari to do amazing stuff. Or it's like a wild horse. But if you've never ridden a wild horse, it's not going to go, oh, I'll do what you want. It's not. But you can run your mind. So we all ready. The fastest way to go into hypnosis, for those of you who haven't done it before, I would like to do it when you get on a plane or a train or would like to do it to sleep better is to roll up your eyes as if you're looking up here. And the trick, and it is a trick, it's also a science, is to keep your eyeballs up but to close your eyelids down. So let's all do it together. Do not roll your head back. Keep your chin exactly where it is. And look up as if you're trying to look into your eyebrows. Just look up. Only use your eyeballs. Keep your eyeballs exactly like that. And keeping the eyeballs up, close the eyelids down. And if you can do that, you can't stop yourself going into this amazing, powerful, deep hypnosis. So let's all do it. Keeping your chin where it is, just look up as high as you can. Roll up your eyes as if you're trying to look into your forehead. Keep your eyes glued to a real or imagined spot overhead. Breathe in. Breathe out. Keeping your eyeballs up, every time you blink, you are going into hypnosis. The more you blink, the deeper and faster you are going into hypnosis roll. Breathe in again. Keep your eyeballs up. Breathe out. And just one more time. Breathe in. This time, hold it. Keep the eyeballs up. Even if it's a little strained, keep them up. And this time as you exhale, keep your eyeballs up. Close your eyelids right down, all the way down. As your eyelids shut down, forget all about the position of your eyes and just drop your chin. Just drop your chin so you really feel that looking down sensation. Just drop your chin down. And I want you to get that same looking down feeling that you might get as you look over a balcony or down a flight of stairs. And as I count backwards, you're going to see your feet, feel your feet, and hear your feet taking each step. Some people are very visual. They can see the steps and their feet and the foot where they have on today taking each step. Other people can feel it. Other people can hear it. It's not important. Your mind is designed to respond to two things, the pictures in your head and the words you hear. And the words I'm saying are causing you to make these pictures. You are right now moving on to step 10. As each muscle, every nerve turns loose, lets loose and you go deeper. You're taking step nine. And you can feel your feet connecting to each step as you go deeper, deeper, deeper into a profound, powerful healing level of hypnosis. You are taking step eight. You can see your feet touching that eighth step as you go deeper, deeper, deeper. You're taking step seven. You can see your feet Hear your feet, even feel your feet connecting to each step as you move down, drift down, travel down to a powerful, healing, transformational level of deep, wonderful, empowering hypnosis. So just let yourself go deeper. You are taking step six as each muscle Every nerve turns loose, lets loose, and you go deeper. You're taking step five, going even deeper still, halfway into this powerful, transformational healing vortex. You are taking step four. As every sound and noise and movement around you carries you deeper and further into powerful, profound, transformational healing hypnosis you are taking step three going deeper with every heartbeat you are taking step two as you gently 
calmly, easily move on over to an even deeper level. You are taking step one. Go deeper, deeper, deeper. Your mind knows exactly what go deeper means. It means go deeper into an awareness of yourself. Go deeper into your own internal state. Every time I click my fingers and say these words, go deeper, drift deeper, sink deeper. You're brilliant genius mind is taking you deeper go deeper go deeper drift deeper sink deeper go deeper 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 even deeper still but please be aware that depth of trance is not linked to results you can be in the lightest state of hypnosis and get the most profound healing you can be a deep catatonic state and get the most profound healing it's not about how deep you are but it's good to believe we're going deeper. So one more time, go deeper, 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 deeper into a powerful state of self-healing where you begin to understand that your body responds to the words you tell it and the pictures you make in your head from this day on. Those words are yours to change. Those pictures are yours to change. The way you feel about anything is because of the pictures you make in your head and the words you say, people say, but I'm not visual. Yes, you are. You could never worry a day in your life if you weren't visual. So now's the time to visualize. And I want you to simply visualize a tingling sensation in your fingertips. Just think about a tingling sensation moving throughout your 10 fingers. You can feel that tingling all across the tips of your fingers. And as you focus on that tingling, it's increasing all by itself. And you can notice that happening. Move that tingling all across your palms. Focus on that tingling sensation in your palms and notice it increases all by itself. And you can simply observe that happening. The more you think about the tingling in your fingers and palms, the more you can notice it. Now move it down to your toes. Focus on a tingling sensation in the tips of your toes as you focus on that tingling. It's increasing all by itself. And you can notice that tingling moving into the ball of your foot, moving into the arch of your foot. And now move it back to your hands. And now move it back to your feet and have the tingling going on in your hands and your feet. You're learning to move energy around your body. It's as simple as thinking about it. Where a thought goes, energy goes, and healing goes. When you think a thought, you create a physical reaction and an emotional response. And whenever you wish to, a healing response too. So now is the time to begin. You've already seen that you think a thought, it creates a reaction. And you can move that energy just by thinking about it, just by telling your mind, make my hands tingle, now make my feet tingle, now make them both tingle. I want you to imagine just above your head is the most beautiful, powerful vortex of energy. It's moving in a clockwise direction from left to right. This energy is rather like a spinning top. It's a spinning top of energy. It's rather like a tornado. I want you to pick a color, a beautiful healing color, pink, white, silver, gold, blue, the color that works for you. And I want you to notice this vortex is about to move through your body, keeping your body completely within its sphere. And all of your vibrations are going to vibrate at exactly the same frequency as this powerful healing energy vortex. Just like a tornado, just like a spinning top, it has a tail. And that's the first part that's going to move into your body. Then it has a middle section that's wider than your hips and shoulders. Then it has a top. And the midsection is about to move into your mind and really work on outdated beliefs. But remember, because this is moving through your body, you have three times, three times to work on your eyes, your gut, your stomach, 
your heart, your beliefs, your hair, your metabolic rate, your immune system, whatever you want. So right now, the top of this powerful, beautiful, vibrating, healing energy vortex, which is spinning, turning, twisting, tipping, is touching the top of your head as it moves into your body. It's moving into your head, and rather like a laser, it is geared to go straight into your mindset and find negative thoughts. And as this vortex finds negative thoughts, negative beliefs, negative imprints, negative impressions you picked up years ago that have been stuck in there, just like the rotating brushes of a car wash, it will dislodge them and move them and shove them out of your body, out of your mind, out of your life, like a big broom. That's where it's going. So right now you can feel this spinning energy this pulsating energy, this turning energy, as this vortex moves completely into your mind. And like a laser, it locates negative thoughts, limiting beliefs, destructive thoughts. I'm not enough. I'm not good enough. I can't do what other people do. I'm not lovable enough. I'm different. This vortex is finding those thoughts and moving them, shoving them, pushing them, moving them out of your mind. It is looking at every syntax, every neuron, and it is dislodging, limiting beliefs, limiting thoughts, anything that could have hurt you, held you back, or limited you, anything that could have limited you from learning, from recognizing how lovable you are, from knowing that you can live in perfect health and wellness. Anything that would stop that, delay that, limit that is already being shoved out of your mind, shoved in front of this vortex, ready to be pushed out of your body. But as this vortex is staying in your mind, it can also install some pretty powerful stuff. It can install in you powers of phenomenal recall incredible confidence, powers of concentration, comprehension, retention, recall, assimilation. Everything you have ever read or experienced in your entire life is in your mind, stored there for your memory. And if you want a phenomenal memory, say to your mind, go ahead and remind me. Your mind is like Google. It is always switched on. It's never on pause. It records everything. And you say to your mind, remind me where my passport is. Take me to my keys. Remind me. And it will do whatever you say. So right now, this vortex is working on coding, installing, imprinting into you a phenomenal memory, incredible, impressive powers of retention, recall, comprehension, concentration, assimilation, your conscious mind is expanding. Anything you focus on, you remember, and you tell yourself, every day I have a phenomenal memory, an incredible memory. I have great focus. When I focus, my conscious mind expands. I take in more and more information. I have phenomenal powers of attention, recall, focus. Say that every day. And it can only, only, only come true. But now this vortex is moving down to your eyes. It's slowing right down. And it's working on your eyes, working on your vision. So you can see perfectly. It's working on your vision. You're able to see the absolute beauty of you. You're seeing yourself the way your children see you. The way people who love you see you. The way your pets your friends see, you're seeing that you are beautiful, you matter, you are deeply significant, you are here for a reason, and you have something phenomenal to offer the world. So allow this vortex to slow right down and work on your eyes. If you have one eye better than the other eye, you can actually do this in your head silently. You can command one eye to use the other better eye. 
as an imprint, as a memory. You can command your mind to go back to its original coding and to give you perfect vision, wonderful vision, outstanding vision. You can see clearly. And in seeing clearly, you see the beauty of you, the wonder of you. Maybe you can even hear that Elvis Presley song playing. It's the wonder, the wonder of you. And you can play that song in your head every time you do the vortex and see the wonder of you. Because when you see the wonder of you, you give the whole world permission to see the wonder of you. So right now, hear that song. See through your own eyes the wonder of you. But also understand that you have immense power to have perfect vision, to have your eyes work perfectly, to have your eyes go back to their original coding and to function perfectly, properly, correctly, exactly as nature intended them to and indeed wants them to. And now the vortex is moving on from your eyes. It's traveling down to your nose, traveling down to your ears, and it's slowing right down. Because now you're beginning to hear every compliment you've ever had. And if there weren't enough, give yourself some right now. I matter. I am deeply significant. I am more than enough. I'm here for a reason. The universe wanted me to be here. It wanted me to be me. And there is something I can do better than anyone else. I'm here for a reason. Imagine hearing those words every day. I matter. I'm significant. I'm enough. I have a purpose. And I live that purpose. Imagine if you could hear that every day. Because you can. Because as this vortex in its vastness works on your ears, but also moves down to your mouth and your throat, you have a voice. And your voice now commits to saying these words every day. I matter. I am significant. I am enough. I am deeply lovable. I easily give and receive love. And imagine having your children say those words every day around the breakfast table. I matter. I'm significant. I'm enough. I'm lovable just the way I am. And I'm here for a purpose with something unique to offer the world. Because that is the truth about you. So I want you to imagine saying it. Say it now in your head. And now let's all say it out loud with power, with unshakable conviction, with absolute certainty. Repeat after me. I matter. I'm deeply significant. I am so enough. I couldn't be more enough. I'm here for a reason. I'm here for a purpose. And now I recognize my own enoughness and my own significance. I give the whole world permission to also recognize my enoughness and my significance. So now you understand when you tell your mind, when you do your job, your mind can only do its job, do your job. So let's stay around the throat, the mouth, the ears, the nose, the eyes for a little bit. And I want you to imagine this vortex is working on all the neurons for anyone who has headaches or thinning hair or any kind of neurological cerebral issues. Your mind is right now working on every blood vessel, every artery, every nerve, commanding, compelling, instructing, directing your mind to go back, back to its original coding, allowing your mind to be clear, your head to be clear, your thoughts to be clear, your words to be powerful. You are commanding, compelling, directing, instructing, coding, your brilliant mind to go back to your original coding, back to your original imprint and impression. So everything in your head, the way your heads feel, the way your thoughts are, what you see, what you hear, what you speak. You have a voice now, and you have 
good vision, you see the beauty of you, the wonder of you, you speak it. And you see the wonder of others and the beauty of them and you speak that too. And your life is already becoming extraordinarily wonderful because you live in wonder. And you are able at any time to say to your mind, I command you, compel you, instruct you, direct you, code you to function perfectly and properly all the time exactly as nature wants you to and intends you to. So now the vortex is moving down to your shoulders, moving down to your neck, starting to travel down your spine. As this vortex travels down your spine, I want you to see it is making your spine straight. It is aligning your spine so that every muscle, every nerve, every vertebrae is like little Lego bricks, all slotting into place. And you sit up straight. You hold your head up high. You have a perfect support system. It is you. You have a strong back. This vortex is spinning, turning, moving, vibrating, ensuring that every disc, every nerve, every muscle, every bone, and every vertebrae in your back is in the right place doing the right job, communicating with every other muscle and nerve. In fact, every organ in your body, every cell, is in the right place doing the right job, communicating beautifully and perfectly with every other cell. As this vortex moves across the small of your back and across the back of your shoulders, it is strengthening, straightening, aligning your posture. You know, back pain is so often linked to lack of support. But when you believe in yourself, and praise yourself, you support yourself. You don't need to give that job to anyone else. Allow that vortex to travel down your spine, to vibrate and turn and twist as it massages the muscles in your shoulders, in your upper back, in the small of your back, to keep you aligned and straight. And while the one part of the vortex is moving, along your spine, the part at the front is moving to your heart, your big, beautiful heart. I want you to see this vortex vibrating, paying particular attention to your heart. You know, many of us have a broken heart, and that's a good thing. You know why? When a bodybuilder wants to make a muscle bigger, they break it down. They break it, and it grows back bigger than ever. Your big, beautiful heart is bigger and more beautiful because of the scars. Some of you might know that in China when priceless Ming vases are broken and they can't make them perfect, they fill them with gold liquid and they look more beautiful broken than they ever looked intact. I want you to see your big beautiful heart. If it's got scars that means it's bigger and better, bigger and better. Your heart has an immense capacity to love, to love you, to love other people, but to love yourself. If you want to attract love, you only have to do one thing, and that is to know you are lovable. So look at your big, beautiful heart and see this is a heart that's able to give and receive. The more I give, the more I receive. The more I receive, the more I give. I am lovable. And so I easily give love, and I easily receive. That is another command you now give to your mind every day. Repeat after me. I am lovable. I accept myself as lovable. I see myself as lovable. I easily give love. I easily accept the love that surrounds me. And I am filled and nourished by that love. And that is the truth about you. So allow this vortex to work on your heart. And now it's working on your lungs. The first thing you did when you were born was to take a breath. And then to give one away. So let's work on some balance. I want you to take a breath and breathe in. I want you to take that breath in. Breathe right down into your stomach. Fill up your lungs with air, and then give it away. And now take another one, 
take a breath, give it away. Take it back, take more breath, take in more, fill up your lungs. Give it all away. And there's your balance of giving and receiving. You give and receive love. You give and receive praise. You give and receive of your gifts and talents. You give and receive. Just like breathing, you can't just give a breath and not take one. And you can't take a breath without giving one. Nature requires you to have balance, giving, receiving. So allow this vortex, this spinning, whirling, twisting, tipping vortex to work on your lungs, to work on your heart, to work on your spine to work on your entire body, filling you up with love and light and healing. This vortex is still moving. The lower part is moving round in your body, twisting, turning, vibrating. You can feel that vibrating. You can feel the spinning. It is spinning, vibrating, and moving all the time, working on your heart, your lungs, your back, your kidneys, all of your organs. All of your organs are benefiting from this powerful frequency vibrating and moving and pulsing around your body. And while the bottom section is working from your neck down, the midsection is still working on your thoughts, your beliefs, your memories, those old imprints, the fact that you've been holding on to beliefs that you believed when you were four or five or ten. And that's not you. That can never be you. When you say, that's not me, those neurons that became like super highways of negativity collapse, they unravel, they just disappear. And instead you fire in better neurons. So now allow that vortex to move down to your stomach, the seat of all emotions. This powerful healing vortex is vibrating, moving, moving into your stomach, moving into your gut, moving into your intestines. And as it moves into your gut, it is finding toxic beliefs. While the top part is in your mind, still finding toxic beliefs, finding toxic residues, chemical residues. It is finding toxic residues, toxic beliefs, chemical residues, chemical beliefs. It is dislodging them all. Remember these brushes of the car wash, spinning, twisting, vibrating, moving, Moving out anything that doesn't serve you, doesn't help you, cannot benefit you. This vortex is vibrating. You can feel it vibrating into your stomach, vibrating into your gut, working on your central nervous system, working on your immune system. Your immune response sites are in your neck, your armpit, your groin. And I want you to feel your immunity becoming massively improved. You can see you have little sentries in all of your immune response sites. And every day they go out looking for disease, for illness, and they surround it and they annihilate it. They vaporize it. Your body has the power to be a wellness-producing machine. And I want you to look at your immune system. Command it. I command you, compel you, instruct you, direct you, and code you to work perfectly. Your job is to keep me in perfect health. And my job is to tell you everything. I command you, compel you, direct you, instruct you to do wellness, wellness, phenomenal wellness, awesome wellness, incredible wellness. Your words form your reality. Your words and the way you talk to your body allows your body to talk to your mind, allows your mind to get those signals and to act on them. Your mind is doing its job. Do yours. Use beautiful words. And now this vortex is still working in your stomach, working in your gut, working on your metabolic rate, working on your digestion, working on your elimination. You eliminate through your breath, through your skin, through your bladder, through your bowels. And you can have perfect elimination. You are eliminating toxins right now. Eliminating toxic thoughts, toxic beliefs, toxic memories, toxic imprints and impressions. They are being diluted and they are being shoved out of your body. I want you to see this vortex like an Im immense broom, like an immense vacuum cleaner, locating all that crud, all that stuff, all that toxicity and just pushing it 
out of your body, out of your mind, out of your life. So now the vortex is staying in your stomach, the seat of all emotions, staying in your gut, the second brain. It's also traveling down your arms to your hands, and your hands are open to receive. Your heart is open to give. Your big, beautiful heart is open to give. And your hands are always open to receive. You receive compliments. You give compliments. You give of yourself, and you receive from that. And if you work for yourself, you can decide, you know, I'm going to value myself more. I can increase my rates. If I give something of value, I must receive something of value back. Whatever we're buying, we buy for one reason, how it makes us feel. If you can make people feel good, you can receive for that too. Remember, you must give and receive, receive and give. Nature requires balance. Give and receive of yourself. Give and receive love. Give and receive health. That vortex is still vibrating, moving, twisting, spinning, working. It's now covering your entire body. The top part is still in your mind, still getting rid of those last lingering negative beliefs, still working on your eyes, your ears, your nose, your throat, your mouth, your voice, your beliefs. The midsection is working on your neck, your shoulders, your heart, your lungs, your liver, your kidneys, all of your organs. And the lower section is starting to move down to your legs, your hips, your thighs. You have perfect balance. Every muscle, every nerve, every gland, every bone, every cell, everything is in the right place at the right time. You are nourished and filled by love, nourished and filled by the fact that you choose to give yourself better food, nourished and filled by the compliments you give and receive. You are a giving, receiving machine. You give and receive love. You give and receive praise, so much praise. Nothing will ever build your self-esteem more than praise, and you give that to yourself every day. You're committing to do that now. You wake up and say, I matter. I'm lovable. I'm enough. And you give yourself better nourishment, more hydration, better sleep. Because this vortex is also working on the sleep part of your body. You don't go to sleep. You don't fall asleep. You lie in bed. You roll up your eyes. Keep the eyeballs up, close the lids, and you say to your mind, I command you, instruct you, direct you, compel you to send perfect sleep to me tonight and every night in your mind goes, okay, I know how to do that. Command, compel, direct, instruct your mind to give you sleep, to give you a phenomenal metabolic rate, an incredible immune system, perfect digestion, a heart that is so open to giving and receiving love. And now you can feel this balance as this vortex just starts to move out of your body. It is traveling down your legs, traveling from your thighs to your knees, traveling to your calves, traveling down to your feet. It's slowing down just a little because it wants you to be so grounded that when you stand up, you are grounded to the earth. You're grounded to the earth. You have perfect balance. You walk with confidence. You speak with confidence. You make eye contact. You matter. You're significant. The way you talk, the way you walk, the way you eat, the way you love, the way you sleep, all reverberate from that saying you say every day, I matter, I'm significant, I'm enough, I'm lovable. You take your place in the world and you stand up straight. So now the vortex is starting to move out through the soles of your feet. I want you to imagine you have two valves. And I want you to open up those valves and let that vortex trickle out and tip out and move out the way you might make a hole in an egg timer, turn it upside down and let that sand trickle out. The vortex is leaving your body. But this is not an ending. This is a brand new beginning. You have the power at any time to roll up your eyes, to imagine your vortex, to let it go through. You can take as long 
or as little as you like. You can let it take minutes. You can take half an hour. You can do it when you're in the bath just before you go to sleep, just after you wake up. And you can have that vortex go to your area, slow down, and you say these words just like this. I command you, compel you, instruct you, direct you, encode you to take my body back to its original imprint and impression and to make it function perfectly and properly for the rest of my long, joyful, gorgeous life because that's what nature wants. Anytime you can command, compel, code, direct, instruct your body to do this. Command, compel, code, direct, instruct your body to heal any organ. Anything that's physical, mental, emotional, it doesn't matter. Your body is a healing machine. If you cut your arm, it knows how to fix it. And it's ready to heal you. So allow that vortex to start moving out through the soles of your feet, pushing in its weight, shoving in front of it all the negative thoughts, all the negative beliefs, all the negative limiting imprints, impressions, ideas, and beliefs that someone gave you, and they're not yours. And as you feel that old stuff being shoved ahead of the vortex, pouring out of your body, trickling out through the soles of your feet. Remember, it was never yours anyway. Someone gave you that old stuff. You've lugged it around, carried it around for years, and now you're letting it go. The most important words in the whole world, let go, let it go. Sing that song from Frozen, let it go, let it go. Who needs all those old imprints anyway? Let it go, let it go. It's pouring out through the soles of your feet. And all that's left behind is clarity, self-love, self-belief, self-healing. So just take a few more moments and remember, you can go ahead and do this anytime, anytime at all. You are able to reinstall that vortex. Command, compel, co-direct, instruct your body. So let it move out of your body, leaving behind wellness, wholeness, And when you're ready, just come back into the room. Just open up your eyes. Just take a deep breath. And if you still feel a bit spinny, that's a good sign. That's a great sign. Thank you so much. People who have made it, on the way to making it, they will take action every single day in the direction of their goals. Now, I can already hear you saying, every day? What, I've got to work seven days a week? No, you really haven't. It's not working seven days a week. It's taking one action that may be very small every single day to get to the top. Let me give an example. One of my clients who's an Olympic athlete was telling me that somewhere he read that Michael Jordan, I think it's Michael Jordan, even trained on Christmas Day and he didn't train on Christmas Day. And he said, when I read that, that someone of that caliber trains on Christmas Day, I trained on Christmas Day. I trained on New Year's Day, and the next year I actually trained twice on Christmas Day, not for very long, but I trained twice, because my feeling was, I want to join that club. I want to be in the same category as Michael Jordan. If he trains on Christmas Day, I'm training on Christmas Day too. And he did, and it kind of changed his ability to see himself in a different category because when you do the things that very successful people do, you begin to go into the same category as them. So successful people take one action. It may be that they make one phone call a day. So rather than saying, I'm gonna work for five days and have two days off, they say, I'm going to do something every single day maybe just for five minutes, I'll make one phone call, I'll send one email, I'll do a tiny bit of work on my blog post. Because when you take action every day, you feel like a winner. When you become a winner, you don't have to do that anymore. The thing I hated was to phone a magazine and to ask them to write about me. What I didn't tell you is I phoned a magazine every single day. I didn't have a day off. Every day I woke up and thought today, 
I'm going to call someone and ask them to write about me. Might be a magazine, might be a newspaper, might be a news station. And I never enjoyed that, but I did it every day. You see, the problem with not doing it every day is that you think, I'll do that tomorrow. I'll make that phone call tomorrow. I'll, I'll work on my blog tomorrow. I'll put some more attention on my website tomorrow. I'll do that exercise thing um, that five minutes of whatever I'm doing, yoga poses tomorrow. But you see, when you take action every day, you can't put it off until tomorrow because you've committed to doing something every day. So recently I saw a client who said, I want you to hypnotize me to go and do 90 minutes of yoga for 60 days without a break. And I said, well, that's a bit hardcore. You know, 60 days, you've got to get on a train, go across London, do 90 minutes and then go back home or go to work. Maybe what you should do is say, I will do some yoga every day for 60 days. But maybe some of the 60 days you're just doing 10 minutes of yoga poses in your own house because I think it's too much of a commitment. And so he changed to that. But I want you to get into that mindset of, I want to be successful. now. Mostly we're talking about success in your business. You may decide that you're a coach and every day you're going to do one thing that will get you another client. You may decide that you want to be healthy and rather than going to the gym seven days a week, seven days a week you will do something, even if it's just skipping for five minutes or a little stretching. Maybe every single day you're going to do something towards your health. Maybe you're going to make a Nutribulla or juice or drink more water. But I want you to understand how very important it is that a habit of success is that you must take action every single day in the direction of your goals. And it's actually better to do a small thing every day because then you start to really feel that you're succeeding. The actions you take on a daily basis determine the kind of person you become, the kind of life you lead, the kind of success you have. So I want you to think with me about what you could do every day because most people do this. They work too hard five days of the week. They put in too many hours. They come home and then when they take the weekend off, which they've deserved, they don't ever really enjoy it because of the guilt, because of the mind saying, I should be doing this and I could be doing that and I ought to be doing that. And even when they go to the cinema, they're thinking, you know, I've got all these emails that need to be answered, all these phone calls I need to make. I need to work on my website, my blog. I haven't spent enough time with my children and they can't enjoy their downtime. We live in a world where we are more stressed than ever before. It's very much a 24 hour world. Even on planes now, you can answer the phone. And you see, you need to be able to really enjoy your downtime, but you can only enjoy it when you've earned it. And another powerful reason for taking one action every day in the direction of your goals is that when you do that, you do start to feel that you are allowed to have downtime. You can enjoy that downtime. It moves you much more towards accomplishment and achievement. So when you start to say, I'm recharging, you begin to understand that this is essential. It is very, very necessary. So if you're the kind of person that goes, okay, Marissa, I've just listened to this day and I don't really want to spend seven days on my business. That's okay. You can take action every day towards your emotional health, your mental health, your well-being by deciding that every day you will do five minutes of meditation. Just eating mindfully, the amount of people I see that, that eat so quickly and then they're always hungry or they think, well, I didn't even enjoy that candy bar because I ate it too fast. The best food I've ever eaten in my life is when I thought, you know, I'm not really eating potatoes. I'm going to eat one of my husband's potatoes. I was having one. Ate it. it was the best potato I ever ate in my life. And sometimes when I'm not eating stuff, I just have a little taste of someone else's. And because I'm not eating it, I eat it slowly and I really savor it. And I'm doing mindful eating and it's an amazing thing. So remember self-care. One of the actions you are taking every day in the direction of your goals is self-care. 
looking after you, meditating, juicing, breathing, drinking water, preparing better food. So this is not about making you on a treadmill seven days a week, far from it. You are like a battery. You must recharge yourself and you must do it properly. So let's think of what you could do every day. I told you that when I wanted to make it in my business, I needed to be seen. And so I made one phone call every single day that took me towards my goals. I didn't have a day off. When I wanted to be fit, I decided that I would do some form of exercise every day because I noticed with my clients who want to embrace fitness, if they have too many days off, they don't go back. So over Christmas, they say, well, the gym's closed. I won't go for Christmas or the next day or New Year. And suddenly they've had five days off and those five days become 10 and the 10 days become 40. But when you never take a day off, it's actually much better. So if you're in the business of wanting to become slimmer, fitter, healthier, don't go to the gym every day, but do one thing for five minutes every day because it stops you slacking or saying, well, I started that and it wore off. The amount of patients who say to me, it wore off, what wore off? Well, I wore off going to the gym, eating healthy food wore off. You know, that commitment to meditating, it just wore off because I forgot to do it for a week. Or yeah, I was being mindful and then it wore off. It doesn't wear off. What happens is you stop doing it. You allow it to wear off. But you see, when you take one action every day, it can't wear off. So let's imagine you're going to meditate or you're going to be mindful. And you simply do that every day, some days for 20 minutes, some days for five. Let's imagine that you, you have a business as a coach where your Monday to Friday job is about working with clients. And then in, when you're not working with clients, you're working on attracting clients. But in your weekends, you could still take five minutes to make a call, make an email, look through some material, find a way of attracting more clients. Let's imagine you have a blog and you just decide at your weekend to work on that for five or 10 minutes, that's all. Try to do it first because you know when you do what you hate first, you feel like a winner. So you're beginning to see how this all segues together. You have learned that your mind does what it thinks you want it to do. And so you're telling it what it is that you want. You are being completely responsible for the pictures and words in your head. You are making good things familiar and negative things unfamiliar. And of course you are making, taking action every day in the direction of your goals familiar and you're making avoiding things unfamiliar. So again, let's imagine you have your own business. It doesn't mean you have to make a phone call every day. Maybe on your weekends, you're going to spend 10 minutes looking at someone who is more successful than you, looking at their blog, looking at their YouTube presence, doing something. I can't emphasize enough, it, it doesn't really matter how big that something is. It doesn't matter if you spend five or 10 minutes on it and then stop. It's more the action of winners take action every day in the direction of their goals until they get to the top. And then of course, when they get to the top, they pay someone else to make phone calls, answer emails. There are no shortcuts, particularly with social media. A lot of people think, well, I've got a presence and if I go on there four times a week, that's okay. When you're on your way to the top, you actually need to do that seven days a week. It's actually the attention to little things that bring about success with big things. So, so many of my clients don't really understand that and work too hard Monday to Friday and don't do anything at the weekend and then look at other people who overtake them and become more successful because they put some attention into the little things. It makes you feel like a winner. So I want you again to think about what you can do. Maybe your thing is to be more successful as a parent or to be more successful in your relationship with your partner. And therefore you can do what I call this thing called deep listening, which means 
you have five minutes of really paying attention to someone else. That's a goal. My goal is to be a much better parent, much more aware of what's going on with my kids. Or maybe my goal is to really make my relationship much more beautiful and committed. And the way to do that is something called deep listening, where you really listen to someone else and feedback what they're saying. Again, really just for five minutes. So rather than think, well, I'll have a day off from that, and it's my Sunday, and I've had all week of work, and I don't want to do anything this weekend except veg out, I really recommend you still take action in the direction of your goals because it will make you feel so much better about yourself. And of course, when you feel better about yourself, you start to feel that you deserve success. When you feel that you deserve success because your actions are taking you towards it, you start to conduct yourself with that air of someone who is more successful. Your thoughts tend to radiate out from you and right back to you people who pick up your thinking. So, Often when I see someone who's very, very famous, all the people around them are slightly in awe of them because they have an air of success. It isn't just that they wear beautiful clothes and look as if they've been steamed. It's that they have this thing that permeates from them. They have this air of, I'm successful. They also have an air of, I'm a good person and I'm a nice person in the same way that very spiritual people kind of emanate this calmness that makes us all feel very calm around them. Successful people kind of emanate this air. But it's all the little actions they take that allow them to do this. So I hope you're getting this. So let me repeat one more time where we are up to today. You are now telling your mind exactly what you want using very detailed very specific, up-to-date, relevant words. You are absolutely making sure that the pictures and words in your head are positive. You are making positive behaviors more and more familiar, and you're making negative behaviors more and more unfamiliar. You are fully committed to doing what you don't like to do, and you are fully committed to doing that first. And now here's a new habit, you take action every day in the direction of your goals. Every day you do one thing in the direction of your goals. If your goal is fitness, that means you do a little something to do with working out. Even if it's skipping or going on a rebounder for a few minutes, you do that every day. Maybe you juice every day. Maybe you chop up vegetables and prefer, prepare healthier food on a Sunday so you can take that to work. Maybe you're more organized with buying the right food. So if, if your area is, is losing weight, then you take action every day. If it's your business, you send an email, you make a phone call, you look at someone else's blog, you look at someone else's material, you think of what you can do to attract clients. You, you look at your business and just work out what you can do by looking at other people who are doing what you want to do and copying what they do. And if it's in your relationship, then every single day you take action. That action may be simply complimenting your partner, making them aware that you know where they're at by saying, you know, I love the fact that you did this or I was fully aware that you did that. It's not difficult and it's not the action. It's the consistent every single day doing something that makes you a winner and recognizing in the beginning, once you take a day off, then you take two days off, then you take three days off and then you procrastinate. And the minute you commit to taking action every day, you cannot procrastinate. So when I had to, I mean, I didn't have to. I chose to ring a magazine or a radio network or a TV station every day. I never wanted to do that. But because I committed to doing it every day, I couldn't take a day off. There was no day off. Part of the commitment was I make one call every day. It took minutes. And when I did it, I felt good about myself all day because I joined that club. People who make it on the way up take action every day. And that's what I did. And I really invite you to do that too, because I see 
over and over again how it changes my clients' lives, how it makes them more successful. And I know it's going to change your life. Check out my next video here. Marilyn Monroe was such an example of someone who looked out there. She believed if I become rich and famous and beautiful, then surely I'll feel lovable. And I've seen many, many clients who say, but no one loves me. I can't find love. 